Hi everybody, welcome to the Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit Research Video Review. If you've been following these, you'll realize we've been going through uh, the CBP Nonprofit Research Publications one at a time. And what I'm going to do is continue that this week. This is our eighth video in the series. I take a project that we've published uh, in the peer-reviewed literature, uh, either myself as a, an author, a co-author, or as an advisor through CBP Nonprofit Research. Uh, the key element is each one of these papers is sponsored by Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. I am president of Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit, our research foundation. And I'm also president of Chiropractic Biophysics Technique and Seminars. There's two, there are two separate entities, so I run both organizations. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, go through one of our research publications. This time what I'm going to be doing is going through another case study. Uh, I've decided to kind of skip around a little bit. I, I'm going to try to stay kind of in order historically, but I also want to add the clinical relevance to it so we don't get lost in some of the biomechanical and background studies that we've done in CBP. So what I'm going to be doing is taking one paper out of this list that's up here uh, that is actually a case study, and we'll go through this uh, publication in detail. Uh, this week, we're going to go through a case report that was done by Dr. Phil Polk down in uh, Georgia. Uh, Dr. Phil, a great, great uh, chiropractor, great CBP practitioner, trained under my late father and my uncle, uh, Glenn Harrison. Also, I helped uh, just a small bit train uh, Dr. Phil uh, in terms of the lumbar traction. However, Dr. Phil uh, had a, a lot of knowledge with CBP prior to me becoming a CBP instructor. Uh, so Dr. Phil contacted myself and my father and he said, hey, I've got a great case that I've been working with, there's great outcomes, and this case uh, needs to be written up for publication. So of course, I jumped on that and I said, let's do it. Uh, we got this written up, submitted, and the great news is the Journal of Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics decided that it was worthy of publication as a case report. So this was presented in 2004, JMPT uh, volume 27, in their online section starts on page 15 on their online section. So the title of the manuscript, Management of a Chronic Lumbar Disc Herniation with Consequences, or sequela, with Chiropractic Biophysics Methods After Previous Failed Chiropractic Manipulative Intervention and NSAIDs, by the way. So Dr. Phil Polk of Georgia and myself, Dr. Deed Harrison. So this is a case of an L5-S1 disc herniation, and we'll also see the consequences with the lateral lumbar radiograph and alignment. Uh, this female is relatively young, 23 years old. She's got chronic low back pain and leg pain and dysfunction. Uh, initially, she was treated with previous chiropractic care of approximately 24 treatment sessions, and she failed to respond to that. That chiropractor sent uh, the patient out for an MRI and for a surgical consult, as we'll see on the next slide. So she presented with chronic low back pain, left leg pain consistent with sciatica with generalized weakness in the lower leg, specifically at the L5-S1 uh, um, disc level and motor level. So she had some sensory and motor deficits we'll see coming up. She describes the pain as constant in her left lower back with pain and tingling down the posterior left leg to the lateral aspect of her left foot. Uh, the pain was pr primarily aggravated by sitting and by lying down, and she remarked that it actually feels like my leg is being squeezed, her words. Here's the lateral lumbar radiograph that was acquired by Dr. Phil Polk, and this is after she's been, uh, you know, through that 24 sessions of traditional chiropractic management, as well as the orthopedic consult and NSAIDs. And you'll see here's the idealized lateral lumbar uh, template line. It is a photograph of the x-ray, so it's not in color. Here's our ideal ellipse. And then this is the back of the patient's vertebral body, body margins. You can see overall a posterior thoracic translation, a hypolumbar lordosis, and specifically a significant retrolisthesis at L5-S1. So we put a line on the back of the body of S1 and the back of the body of L5, and you'll note that that's a significant uh, retrolisthesis. Of interest, there's 
The sacral base angle here would be considered within normal limits. Ideal is uh, 40 degrees, this is 37, so pretty darn close. Okay, so MRI, what did the MRI show? You know, I apologize, I don't have a picture of the MRI. We only had the report uh, for this presentation, so we're presenting the report, not the actual image. Uh, the MRI showed disc degeneration that was moderate at the L5-S1 level, as well as a moderately sized central disc herniation. Obviously, this is the culprit that's affecting that L5-S1 nerve root. Uh, when she presented to Dr. Polk, she reported her average pain as a 5 out of 10 on a numerical rating scale. That means that's moderate pain, which is quite common in these cases. Uh, range of motion restrict, uh, restricted and painful thoracolumbar extension and left rotation. Okay, so we see this, we go side posture is probably not the best thing to do with her. She's got painful range of motion when she twists to the left, so maybe we can do right-sided rotation if we're going to adjust, but that had been previously done to no avail. So we'll show you what we did uh, coming up. The positive uh, reduction in the reflex was found at the left SLR, or excuse me, the straight leg raise was positive on the left, uh, both seated and supine, and then uh, reduced L5-S1 Achilles reflex uh, was identified. Now, just a little bit of a background. I'm gonna go through three papers historically uh, in the literature that relate to this particular case. Now, there's obviously more than three, but these are the, the ones that I would like you to be aware of. The first one's 1991 out of the International Journal of Rehabilitation Research. This is on clinical findings as outcome predictors in rehabilitation of patients with sciatica. So we're talking about patients that fit our patient's uh, category, and we're talking about findings that predict uh, poor outcomes or good outcomes. So here's what they identified as poor prognostic findings in subjects that have the, this uh, uh, long-term sciatica, if you will. Number one, initial sensory deficits in the leg. Number two, tenderness in lumbar extension. Number three, decreased repetitive trunk flexion capacity. That's sit-ups, how many sit-ups you can perform. I'm not advocating that you do this with patients. This is what the study did. Also, decreased lumbar lordosis and tightness of the hamstrings. Now, our patient has number one, our patient has number two, and our patient has number uh, four. So we've got three out of the five findings that predict a poor prognosis in our patient. Likely speaking, this is why she failed conservative chiropractic. Conservative chiropractic traditionally does not address the loss of the lumbar curve. Okay, so this is paper number one, 1991. Paper number two, Jackson et al. Spine, 1998. This is a, a prospective uh, review of four different types of populations. Uh, one is a normal population. Another one is uh, adult patients with symptomatic degenerative lumbar discs. That's like our, our patient. And then patients with uh, spondylolisthesis and then patients with idiopathic or degenerative scoliosis. Now our case would be number two. She's got a symptomatic degenerative lumbar disc with a retrolisthesis. Here's what Jackson et al. concluded, and then I'm gonna show relevant findings in the population that's uh, important for our case. Understanding the common and characteristically different compensations that occur with balance in these patients who had specific spinal disorders may help to improve their care. Now, what does that mean? They're looking at x-rays, full spine radiographs of these patients compared to normals. So they're saying there is a problem with the normal alignment in these particular cases of you know, different populations with a condition compared to a healthy population. So we've got an alteration in the sagittal plane curve. So let's look and see what they find with symptomatic degenerative disc uh, conditions. Here's what they identified in this uh, particular paper, 1998, prospective uh, case control population. Most patients with degenerative lumbar disc disease may already have subtle but significant loss of segmental lordosis in the lower spine. Of interest, we'll see that's where our patient has a loss of their lumbar curve. 
when standing compared to that of asymptomatic volunteers, aka our control population in this paper. This indicates that perhaps more attention should be given to restoring the segmental lordosis of the fused or in instrumented low, uh, lower lumbar spine. Now that's from the surgical perspective. How about conservatively if we just try to do it first and tell somebody or before somebody gets screws put in their back? It seems logical to me, right? This becomes a little bit of a ridiculous scenario. Surgeons are okay to do this, but chiropractors are not okay to try to do this conservatively. It blows your mind. It blows your mind. Now, I'm not bashing the surgeons. I'm bashing the chiropractors in the research community and the insurance whores that work for insurance companies that say, oh, you know what? Corrective care is not needed for restoration of altered lumbar lordosis. It has no bearing on patient health. Well, you know what? Look at what the surgeons were saying in 1990s, right? Jackson is one of the preeminent orthopedic surgeons. He's saying, you know what? Patients with this condition have loss of the curve. We should correct it surgically. I'm here to say, why don't we do it conservatively first, and then if the patient fails that, we'll send them to surgery. You know what? The chiropractic profession, some of these insurance people out there, you know what? You know who you are? This type of information totally combats your personal opinion and your agenda. And I'm putting this out there for everybody to see. And hopefully this will make a change. Hopefully chiropractors will use this to defend their treatment for their cases. And patients will use this to defend their right to get this type of care. Back to this. This has the potential of reducing the development of degenerative changes above and below the fusion. Imagine that. Restoring normal alignment protects and prevents from future spine breakdown. What a concept. Burlman, 1999. Now this one's very specific to our case. This one has to do with retrolisthesis. Here's what they did. Standing upright lumbar x-rays and CT or MRI of 69 patients with confirmed 20 of them with a retrolisthesis. 23 cases had, had a degenerative spondylolisthesis, and then these subjects had no signs and symptoms of abnormal spine alignment like degeneration or instabilities. Here's what they identified in the retrolisthesis population. And by the way, these were all patients with chronic back pain. Lordosis of the lumbar spine and the in-plate inclination were considerably reduced in patients with retrolisthesis. What does that mean? Well, they go hand in hand. You lose your curve, the end plate in the lower lumbar spine and the mid lumbar spine is going to rock backwards and it's going to be become more vertical instead of orientated downward. This correlates to loss of the lumbar curve. Conclusion in this paper in 1999, biomechanical considerations, a retrolisthesis of the lower lumbar spine is correlated with a reduction of lumbar lordosis, reduced in plate inclination, and reduction in segmental disc height. This is exactly what our patient has. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're gonna say, look, the patient's already failed traditional chiropractic uh, spinal manipulation. What they haven't done is specific corrective care. So we're gonna put this patient on three to four times a week for each week until we reach 36 visits. So the patient's going to receive this type of intervention three to four times a week until 36 visits. So it's nine to 12 weeks. What are we doing here? Well. This is not the patient, we didn't have a photo, but this is what was done. Patient prone on a drop table, elevate the hips up in the air. Notice that we're supporting the ASIS and only allowing a little bit of pelvic flexion. Why? Well, the sacral base angle is relatively normal. Also, I don't wanna allow a lot of pelvic flexion because that'll create a problem with the retrolisthesis moving forward. Too much flexion will create a little compression on that L5-S1 disc of the pelvis, too much flexion of the pelvis. So what we're doing is contacting the L5 segment spinous process while we're translating the rib cage forward. So we translate the rib cage forward relative to the pelvis and then I load the L5 spinous process with an instrument. Now this is not a really light tap. We're actually trying to you know, see if we can cause a true shift of the vertebra. We know that this will cause oscillation of the vertebra but we're hoping that this will also help move the vertebra from point A to point B. Now classically, we know that may not occur, but when there's a retrolisthesis, this may actually be of benefit. 
right? Number one, we're moving the rib cage translate in, into translation forward. That is going to cause a shift of the segments anterior. And then if I contact L5 and move it forward, this is nothing but common sense, applied biomechanics. We're gonna turn the instrument up to its mid or high setting depending on the patient tolerance. High would be recommended if the patient can tolerate it, maybe not the first couple uh, times, but certainly as the patient gets used to it. Now high is just really when you look at it, it's approximately the same total load that you would apply uh, by your hand. However, it's much more focused because we have a smaller surface, surface area on the stylus of the instrument. Thus the force per unit area is higher. So I have a better probability of moving this segment using an instrument likely than I do by hand, simply because of the force per unit area. Then what I'm going to do is I can also translate the rib cage forward as well. I can use the thoracolumbar lumbar junction to drop down on the drop table. Again, it's anterior translation, block the ASIS to limit the pelvic flexion, and thrust down forward. We're using the pelvic drop in this case. You could also use this lower thoracic drop if you chose to. You can also contact L5 spinous with your hand and shift it forward. However, your hand is going to be a broader surface area than the stylus of the instrument. I would recommend doing both techniques. Then what we're going to do is traction. Now this traction is not exactly correct uh, for our case but it's pretty close. I'll show you the patient setup uh, that uh, we have a photo of the actual patient. But ideally what you'd want to do is you'd take this lower leg strap and you'd move it closer to the ASISs. We don't want an extreme amount of pelvic flexion here. What we want to do is create more shear load on this retrolisthesis L5 on S1 and see if we can slide it forward. So my strap should be placed at the lower lumbar spine L4, L5, you can't get exactly on L5 due to the hips or the iliac crest, right? So we try to get in the lower lumbar spine and we're trying to uh, load this area forward at about a 20 degree angle tilted towards the feet. That way we can increase the in-plate tilt angle at the same time we increase the distal lumbar curve. Okay, we're also, we are translating the thoracic cage forward because the patient had posterior thoracic translation. So we use a block behind the person, three to four inches. And we also keep the legs relatively even with the, the uh, femur heads or the pelvis. So the legs should be kept relatively straight. So this setup, ideally, this strap would move closer to the ASIS. Uh, here's the actual patient in the setup, okay? So here's the actual patient performing this setup. And you can see that she has no problem doing it. She's comfortable. She's in her after work clothes. She comes in, she gets this treatment. So for patients out there, you realize you don't have to be in a gown. You don't have to be in sports athletic equipment. Uh, you do want to have, you know, if you're wearing a dress, a longer dress, or you want to put shorts on underneath, okay? So anyway, you can see the patient is in this position. Uh, 79 total treatment sessions, but with staged re-examinations along the way. Now, traction times. We start with one to three minutes per the patient tolerance, and then we're gonna build the patient up to 15 to 20 minutes per session. Why 15 to 20 minutes? That's what it takes to deform the soft tissues to get viscoelastic creep. We'll talk about that in different projects upcoming, and we've talked about it already with the cervical spine traction study that we did. Also, the patient's going to perform mirror image exercises. Now, what we want to do is try our best to block the upper portion or the upper one-third of the pelvis so we don't get a lot of pelvic flexion when we do this. So you can see the block height here is in the upper one-third of the patient's pelvis. The patient translates the rib cage forward, maintaining that position in a maximum position forward for five to 10 seconds and then relaxes back to neutral. We're going to do this five sets of 10 repetitions, 50, uh, or uh, yeah, 50 repetitions, so five sets of 10, okay? The patient can do this at home and in the office. You may start somebody seated. Now, sometimes seated might be a little more challenging for somebody uh, with back pain, especially the patient. In this case, she complained of pain that was increased while seated. So we would try the standing exercise first. We don't want to do simple pelvic flexion exercises. It's not a pelvic flexion problem. So 
The, the reason is, if you, if you can picture in your mind the pelvis rocking forward here, that would just create a pinching compression on the posterior elements, L5-S1 facet and likely L5-S1 disc posterior. Not the best thing to do. So we don't want to do a simple pelvic flexion. We're doing an anterior thoracic translation trying to inhibit a lot of the pelvic flexion by using a block at the top of the pelvis. Okay, so here's our staged re-examinations. We do not just treat somebody 79 sessions and then reevaluate at the end of those sessions. We have staged reexaminations so we can see and monitor the patient's progress. If there's good progress, consistent improvement in the patient's condition, both physical and symptomatic reporting, then we're happy to continue the care. If there's not consistent progress, then we have to reassess and try a different type of approach. In this case, the patient progressed nicely each of the three re-examinations. So we have a total of four examinations in uh, 79 visits. Okay, so here's our initial radiograph. It's 7-27-2001. Here's our first follow-up, October 11th, 2001. And then we've got November and then December. And you'll notice the L5-S1, the normal value, 32 degrees. Our patient at first had 42 degrees. That's due to the retrolisthesis and the rocking backwards of L5 as S1 stays tilted downwards. So that's way too much extension at L5-S1. Now we call this a total loss of the lumbar curve because if you look at the L4, L5 angle, the L4, L5 angle and the L3, L4 and the L2, L3, those are my angles that are reduced. Now the L5, S1 is quite increased. It's increased by about a third. This is a problem with our case. So what we wanna do is see those values all change back towards normal. The L5, S1, look at this, 42 goes to 32. 13 goes to 19, 10 to 9, probably not really a change, and then you can work your way up. And at the end of it, you can see we've got a much better distribution of the, the uh, segmental lumbar lordosis. It's much more elliptical, and we don't have this hyperextension at the uh, L5-S1 that we had before. The total lumbar curve, the patient started at 25, ideal is 40 and now the patient's at 36 degrees. So we've really improved the, the total angle of curve as well as the distribution of the lumbar curve. This is what Jackson et al. were referring to in their surgical pa paper. We wanna change the, the distal lumbar curve, redistribute the normal curve if we can in these patients with symptomatic degenerative disc disease. Well, we've done it conservatively here. Here's the uh, end, re-examination x-ray so you can look at the before and after. Now the retrolisthesis is still there. Retros are hard to change but if you'll notice the alignment of the L5-S1 segment and the alignment of the lumbar curve and the change in the translation. We've done exactly what we set out to do. Now how did it benefit the patient? If you read the paper you'll see at each re-examination the patient shows progress. Range of motion is improving not as painful. Chronic back pain, the intensity of it is dropping down. Reflexes are improving. At the end of it, we've got no pain at all. She was chronic for a few years, and now she's no pain. Now the straight leg ra raise is normal. The reflex is normal at L5-S1 Achilles reflex, and we've got no weakness. Discussion. There are at least, you know, at least two other ways of improving patient symptoms in lumbar disc degeneration and herniation with back pain and sciatica. Now the first one is generalized chiropractic side posture spinal manipulation. If you read the literature on this, up to 50 to 80 percent of cases will respond favorably to chiropractic standard care. It's a good thing to try. However, in our patient, she failed 24 sessions of that. It didn't work. Okay. She then was sent out for an orthopedic consult. The surgeon said, you know what? You're not really at a surgical case right now. This is manageable. You don't have true atrophy of your lower leg muscles. Uh, nerve conduction velocity was done if you read the paper. The nerve uh, conduction velocity was actually within normal limits. So there wasn't true signs of yet overt nerve root compression causing atrophy. 
that's when we really want to strongly consider a surgical, you know, uh, a surgical intervention. There comes a point in time where atrophy, once it reaches a certain level, doesn't come back. You don't want to, you know, have that risk in that particular patient. Certainly we can manage some of those cases, but that's a, a risk factor. So anyway, the patient failed this particular approach. Approach number two, we could have tried Cox flexion distraction work. That's a reasonable thing to do for uh, lumbar disc herniations. There's some great papers in the literature that the Cox group has put out, okay? So I'm not here to say that's not a good option to try. However, in our patient, I don't think it's a good thing to do. Our patient already had loss of their lumbar curve. Why would you do distraction for somebody that had loss of the lumbar curve? So in my perspective, this case has loss of the lumbar curve with a retrolisthesis. Why don't we try to reestablish that curve and see how that works? Now, if that hadn't had uh, or hadn't have improved this particular patient, then we could have tried Cox flexion distraction to provide the person with some uh, additional type of intervention. However, that wasn't needed in this case, and the likely reason it wasn't needed is because the treatment, the intervention we did, matched exactly the biomechanical problem of the patient. We're translating the rib cage forward. We're causing shear on a segment that has gone posterior. We're shearing it anterior and we are increasing the lumbar curve. That is what was needed in this case. Conclusion, in cases with a loss of the lumbar lordosis with a complication of L5-S1 retrolisthesis, the extension traction combined with posterior anterior shear, shear load at L4-L5-S1 from the traction straps appears to be the more mechanically correct setup in this particular case than flexion distraction or torsion manipulation. Now, we didn't try flexion distraction, so we, we can't adequately say that, you know, that wouldn't have worked. But what we can say is this is a case that provides pretty clear evidence that when you apply the wrong type of care, a patient doesn't respond. When you apply the right type of care, a patient does respond. This patient failed traditional chiropractic manipulation. They failed NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they weren't severe enough to be a surgical candidate, so basically what else do you do? Well, you know what? You apply logic and common sense. You x-ray their spine, you compare them to established normals that we have, and then you apply standard, proper CBP intervention consistently with staged re-examinations. 79 total treatments. Probably past what an insurance company wants to give you, but who gives a crap what an insurance company wants to give you? The last time I checked, your insurance adjuster probably didn't even graduate college. They were lucky, lucky to do high school. You know what? And that's my opinion on it. These are not doctors out there. They don't have the training that we do. They have never seen your patient. They shouldn't be telling you what you should and should not do with your patient. We are the experts in the spine. We should dictate the care that the patient is receiving, especially when it's a two-way communication street. The patient decided this is what I want to do, and the doctor, who is the expert, decided this is the right thing for you. And we track the patient. They are improving. This should be appropriate. It blows my mind that this is not appropriate in this world of evidence-based care. What do you call this? No evidence? This is a published case report in the peer-reviewed literature. There is absolutely a need for this in patient populations. The patients out there that are suffering with this, they need help. They don't need another drug. They don't need another surgery unless it's severe where they need to have spine surgery. But you know what? Many of these cases fail surgery. That's why the surgeon didn't want to do it. He knew that this case was likely one of these cases that was going to be a surgical failure. He or she didn't want to put their reputation at stake. Conservative corrective care with chiropractic biophysics is absolutely what improved this patient's care. Till next time. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Please continue to, to support CBP Nonprofit. You can do that in one of two ways. You can do this directly by going to our website link here and donating to CBP, or you can support us through Amazon Smile indirectly with your purchases. Just select Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit as your research organization. I really enjoy uh, doing these uh, videos. If you can't tell, I get a little excited some, sometimes, and I'm gonna speak my mind. 
And uh, I, I can tell you right away that some of these case or some of these presentations, you'll uh, definitely get an earful from me. But hopefully, it wakes you up and shocks you. And if you're a consumer out there, a patient, this should actually you know motivate you to seek out a CBP chiropractor. Find us online. Go to CBP patient.com. You can look up CBP trained uh, chiropractors anywhere in the world. You don't have to come to just me or the other CBP instructors. You can see that this case was by a CBP trained doctor. They absolutely know what they, they're doing. They're great doctors, men and women, and you can't go wrong by putting your health in their hands. They'll guide you in the appropriate way. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.